Hello and welcome to the Pilot Base Podcast. I'm Ben and I've been a pilot for over a decade. And I'm Dave, categorically not a pilot. Every Monday we'll be chatting to both pilots and non-pilots with amazing aviation stories from all around the world. You can find all episodes of the Pilot Base Podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to our channel and leave us a review. In this episode, we meet Emma Henderson, MBE. Pilot, captain, TV star, wife, mother, farmer, triathlete, founder of Project Wingman, recognized by the Queen and honored for her services to charity. She's come a long way since joining that university air squadron in her youth. We cover a lot of ground in this podcast and those headlines are just the start. It's a great chat with a great human being to sit back and enjoy. Captain Emma Henderson, MBE, welcome to Pilot Base. Now, are you both captain and MBE or does one uh, supersede the other? No, I can be both of those. So um, because obviously captain relates to my um, qualification in my career and the MBE is um, an honour awarded to me by Her Majesty the Queen, which is a huge honour and I'm very excited about it as you can imagine. <laughs> I certainly can although what was the the presentation of it like not the traditional one that we've become accustomed to over there. Yeah via second class post I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well um, I mean the the notification of it was um, something that happened by email whereas normally that would be a letter and the actual yeah. presentation and collection of it um, well, it remains to be seen because they still haven't presented last year's New Year's Honours yet. And then there's the Queen's birthday ones as well. So um, in terms of that, I, the idea is that you go to Buckingham Palace or Holyrood to collect it. But um, actually, that may not happen at all. So um, or, and if it does, it won't be for at least a year. Oh, amazing. That's just another thing to look forward to, though, isn't it? We're, we're always looking for reasons to be cheerful and things in the future that we can get excited about. Oh, and a little absolutely. Trip to the oh. I, well, to be honest with you, even if I don't end up going... So the other option, if, if they decide to just clear the backlog by not doing palace presentations for this tranche of um, honours, then that would mo most likely be awarded to me by the Lord Lieutenant of Murray, which is the county I live in who um, I also sit on a trust with, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, so actually, even if it was presented to me by him, he's still the Queen's representative in Murray, and it would still be, you know, we'd make it a lovely occasion and it would still be really nice. So even if I didn't get that trip to the palace, which I obviously hope I do, because it will mean a new dress and something to put on my head, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then um, you know, it will still be a lovely occasion and it's still, you know, something amazing to look forward to. So, yeah. So the actual honour is... Is it official now, is it, as of the 1st of January? Yes, as of the 1st of January. I found out on the 3rd of December, and you're sworn to secrecy. <laughs> can't tell anyone, apart from um, if you work for a company or a charity, you can tell your press people. So um, I have a press person, so I told her. Um, and um, so the, other than that, you can't tell anyone. So I had this massive secret to keep from my children and my parents and my, yeah, the rest of my family. And, oh, even close family, um, you, can't, you can't even tell them? No, it's supposed to be kept a complete secret until the embargo is lifted, which this year was at 10.30 on the 30th in the evening. And I was um, actually on FaceTime to my son um, around 10 o'clock in the evening because he lives in London. And um, my brother-in-law phoned me at like 10, 30 and 30 seconds and said, were well, you going to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, yes, I was, but I didn't realise it was going to actually hit the news at 10, 30. You know, I thought they might have waited till the morning or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was that secret. Oh, see, it would have been a great way to sneak it in when you were doing your Christmas cards. Uh, best wishes. Good luck in the new year. Emma Henderson, MBE. Yeah, well, you'd know <laughs> who'd read them then, wouldn't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, amazing. So, oh, wow. So, so you, your family found out on the news before you'd run them? Yes, quite a <laughs> lot of them did. So um, I was able to tell, you know, the children and um, my parents and my husband's parents, we did tell them earlier in the evening um, because we didn't want them to find out on the news. But other than that, it was a complete secret from everyone. So the, the hilarious thing actually was on the morning of New Year's Eve, when I woke up and switched my phone on, there were so many messages. I had 400 messages and it, the oh, phone didn't know which noise to make first, whether <laughs> it should be an email or a text or a message or whatever. 
so it made this kind of cacophony of different noises which was quite cool actually <laughs> yeah I can I can imagine although quite scary for a bit it must have felt like the millennium yeah. bug all over again well part of it I was just thinking are you ever going to stop you know just yeah. how am I going to reply to all these messages and eat and sleep you know so um yeah, it was amazing, absolutely fantastic thing to have. And, and like you say, a fantastic thing to look forward to, but it's also um, something that's a collective effort. You know, yeah. I haven't been given an MBE for being Emma Henderson. I've been given an MBE for being Emma Henderson, CEO of Project Wingman and all that goes into that. So that's all the back office staff and all the hours they've put into it. And crucially all the volunteers and all the time they've spent going into hospitals and actually do, making it a reality, you know, so that's the that's the real sort of accolade for them as well I think. Well if you are able to go and collect your gong as it were it means that we've evolved in terms of being able to have mass gatherings so that sounds like a Project Wingman celebration party to me. Absolutely and I've already um, I mean even back in the middle of last year I was talking to people about you know when we can all move around again I think we should have um, a big you know wingman ball or something like that but that needs to include um partners as well because you know when you give a lot to something like this whether you are doing my role or whether you're volunteering in the hospital whether you're doing some of the back office admin stuff um your partner inevitably is not going to see you for quite large periods of time and and so i think you know i've always found it strange um when the um, airline i worked for had a sort of recognition award ceremony and partners weren't invited to that. And I kind of got it because it was a big party anyway, but I always sort of think that your success is based on the people that are around you as well, because if you're not supported by them, then it's harder for you to go out and do things well, isn't it? So. Absolutely. Um, now, we've got ahead of ourselves here and it's been such a jovial start, but we must scold you to begin with, Emma, because you were late. Why were you late? <laughs> I was late and that will come as no surprise to some of my friends who walk their dogs with me regularly <laughs> and so they actually now say to me we'll meet half an hour earlier knowing that they're <laughs> going to turn up but um so I do tend to have um I don't wear a watch for a start um and uh, but I was on the I was on the phone to um I was talking to somebody from the Telegraph so um uh... so you know which is a lovely, actually, it's a really lovely um, thing to have been doing. So there's um, a lady who writes something called You Are Not Alone, which is um, a weekly newsletter that um, The Telegraph puts out. And I've spoken to her before, and it was an update really about um, where Wingman is and what we've been doing and the things that have changed since I spoke to her last summer. So it was just fantastic to be able to do that and just get a little bit more um, awareness, wider awareness of what we are and who we do, who we are and what we're doing. <laughs> um, so um, not the other way around. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was really nice. But inevitably, when you sort of back these things up together, you say, yes, I can meet you at 10 o'clock and I can meet you at half past 10. I can meet you. At, um, it always runs over. So I do apologise. I take the scolding and yeah. I promise to do better next time. And just to confirm, that lateness was 90 seconds, so yeah. it's not yes. a disaster. <laughs> unacceptable, unacceptable behaviour. <laughs> so the fact that you don't wear a watch, is that the reason that none of my flights ever take off on time? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> my flights always left on time. I, I always wore a watch at work, but um, no, since I always had this thing that when I wasn't at work, I don't want to be sort of beholden to the time of day. And... Yeah. Um, I've got a clock in the downstairs dining room and, you know, I've got my phone. I can check the time if I really need to. And if it's something very um, important, I really mustn't miss. And I can always set an alarm on my phone, but I never do. And um, I just don't like wearing a watch. So um, unless I'm at work, it to me, it sort of signifies being at work. So and I'm not at work anymore. So <laughs> fair enough. Just looking at some of the, the things you've done publicity wise, BBC Radio 4, The Telegraph, Channel 5, so much regional <laughs> news, mentions at the Chelsea Flower Show, your parliamentary MP, yeah. and now the big one, of course, the pilot-based podcast as well. I mean, cool. This is the big scoop of the year, really. It well, is, it is, it is. Actually, it is the scoop of 2021. So. <laughs> <laughs> Get that, get that on the testimonials, Ben. That's, yeah, that's we'll do. Don't worry, it's already. The Block biggest thing I've done this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic.
fantastic stuff. <laughs> um, but I'd like to talk about you uh, being a pilot first. This is a, a pilot base. Uh, well, it's a pilot's podcast first and foremost. Um, are you from an aviation family? What was your journey into the, the cockpit? No, I'm not from an aviation family at all. Um, I grew up in um, a fairly small town in Essex. Um, my dad is a businessman. He's still a Lloyds broker. And so the only aviation link, I suppose, is that his, his business was centred on aviation and marine. Um, and my mum um, was a teacher who left teaching to go and work for my dad's business. So we grew up um, very... I would say I would say very ordinarily, um, but I know it wasn't ordinary. I know we had a very blessed upbringing. You know, um, I sailed boats. I had a horse, I did, and I thought I that would be the sort of thing I would do in the future. Would be those sorts of along those sorts of lines. And I did always have a fascination with flying. Um, so I've still got um, because I'm a hoarder. I've still got in my loft school projects I did when I was eight about flight. And um, so I did have this massive fascination and I loved the science museum because it had sort of models of Montgolfier balloons and, you know, early aircraft and things. And, and I used to read Biggles books because I loved them and I just thought it's so exciting. So I, I must, I did have this fascination, but I was never that child that said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a pilot. And um, when I was again, about eight, um, the, spe the first space shuttle um, enterprise went around the world on the back of a 747 and it came into Stansted and which was not far from where we lived and I begged my mum and dad to take us to see it which they did and um, I've got a photo of me standing in front of this 747 with a space shuttle on the back of it oh, which amazing. is amazing <laughs> and the only other thing I've seen since then that's more that's equally as amazing with aircraft is um, when an Antonov, which is the largest aircraft in the world, came into RF Kinloss, which is where I live, um, and took a Nimrod away. Um, it had its wings taken off and it took the fuselage of a Nimrod away to be resprayed and, um, and, and turned into a new aircraft. And this fuselage was inside this Antonov and seeing that take off, you know, it used every inch of runway to actually get airborne. So that was really amazing. But the first thing I'd seen was this massive aircraft with a space shuttle on the back of it which is incredible and so I obviously um, after that decided I was going to be an astronaut as you would yeah. and um, I had this enormous poster of the space shuttle taking off on my bedroom wall till I was about um, 18 which is probably why I couldn't keep a boyfriend and <laughs> <laughs> and um, but then, you know, when I went to university, my plan was to, um, I did a history degree. Um, I, my plan was to go and convert that into a law degree and become a hotshot lawyer in the city. That was where my um, thoughts lay at the time. And I even had a placement lined up with a firm in London to do, um, you know, in, in my summer holidays and things like that. But um, I spent my first year um, sailing, racing boats for the university. And uh, in my second year, I walked into Freshers Fair and saw this big sign saying, learn to fly for free. And I'd had a flying lesson for my 18th birthday, which I'd loved, but um, even back then it was quite expensive to have flying lessons and I didn't have the means to pay for it quickly enough to, to do it. So I saw this sign saying, learn to fly for free. And I thought, brilliant, how do you mm -hmm. do that? And it was the University Air Squadron. So I went and chatted to them and signed up on the spot and said yes I'd like to do that thank you very much and then got home and thought what on earth am I doing I don't want to be told what to do by other people so I um, actually retracted my application and they came around the next day and said please don't do that please keep the application in so I did and I went down for this interview at what was then Aria Finningley which is now um, Doncaster Robin Hood Airport and um, got, got a place on the Yorkshire University Air Squadron and spent two years there flying um, bulldogs that was the air, air force pl trainer plane at the time so um that's where i learned to fly and um the first weekend you go down at the weekend and you have a lecture on a friday night um or that's how it was then um and then you flew saturday and sunday and uh, the first weekend that i was down at um, finningley i um walked into the bar and met some people i'd met at parties before in uh, leeds where i was at university and um one of these guys introduced me to his group of friends and one of those guys that he introduced me to was um, the only one that didn't have a name like 
you know, smash taff Mountie Magoo. Um, and uh, he was the only one with a normal name and that was Jim. And um, actually he's now been my husband for 25 years. So. Yes, what a win. So I met him on my first weekend there. And, um, and largely because of that, we were, we got engaged after six months and married a year later. And oh, wow. um, yeah, and, uh, and mostly because of that and the fact he was sent up to Kinloss, I put my papers into Cranwell and um, did aptitude tests and they said marginal for pilot and exceptional for navigator. And I thought, don't really want to be a navigator. I'll just marry one instead. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. And that was it for, um, I didn't fly again. Um, I sort of walked away from it, um, moved up to an employment black spot with an English surname and an Air Force address, so I couldn't get a job. <laughs> and uh, I did get jobs. I did work. I, um, I worked in a call centre selling wow. dubious videos to people in dubious magazines and then uh, working on um, parking tickets um, was one of the things I worked on in that call centre. I worked for a farmer as a secretary where I um, sometimes... Um, I'd always take my wellies because you never knew if you'd be writing letters <laughs> or herding cows, which was really good fun. And um, eventually became um, an office manager for a leisure company. And um, that was my life. And I just didn't really think I'd fly again. Um, I had turned down a, a, an offer from British Airways to go to the, they had a cadet training centre in Presswick, but I um, got a place on that and then turned it down because it was you know, down the road in Glasgow, which now wouldn't seem anything. But back in the mid nineties, when phones were stuck to walls and the only mail you received was in the post, um, you know, it seemed like a long way away and we just got married. So it, that was the right thing to do, to not do that. Um, and then, you know, in 2003, um, we had just built our house. We'd been living in it for a year and loved it. And um, somebody somewhere decided it would be a good idea for us and our little family. We had three children by then. Us and our little family to move 12,000 miles around the other side of the world to New Zealand, which um, was the beginning of the whole adventure, really. It was the beginning of a whole new life. And um, that's really where the, the flying story started again. So let's uh, let's fast forward to that then. Uh, you put it to the back of your mind. It was something that was was great memories and had essentially led to you having a brilliant life with a husband and kids and and opportunities and fun jobs by the sounds of things. If not yeah, things that were. you wanted to, uh, well, you make to spend... them fun, don't you? <laughs> oh, of course, especially the farming. I mean, goodness oh, me, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so you got to New Zealand. What happened then? Well, um, my brother had moved out there um, in 95 when he got married and he's still there. So it was a fantastic gift for us to be moving near to him. And there's just the two of us. And um, although obviously very difficult for my parents now have both their children so far away. But we moved out there and, um, you know, just settled into this amazing life as expats. It was just it was really good. And I had just turned 30 just before we, we went and I'd spent my 20s having kids when all my mates were in London having careers and a life. And um, it, it was a fantastic place to be because I think, you know, I had got married and essentially turned into my mum, who's a lovely lady, but she's like 25 years older than me. So, um, you know, turning 30 and moving to New Zealand, um, loads of different things happened to help me to understand who I actually was, um, rather than being, you know, the daughter of a relatively big fish in a small pond in Essex, or the wife of an Air Force officer, or the mother of three children, suddenly I was able to start finding out who Emma Henderson was, and um, lots of different things happened. Um, I was basically a heavy, in both senses of the word, heavy smoker, fat, didn't run or exercise, um, hadn't lost my baby weight, ate lots of chocolate, um, very quite unhealthy person who had a really big penchant for wine. And, um, you know, it's a very healthy lifestyle out there. You know, um, I met people who did things like running and um, I thought, well, you're not on fire. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I, I basically um, got to a point uh, we, where we'd been there a few months where I um, thought, you know, I really need to stop smoking and I need to sort my life out a bit and um, started um, running and took up triathlons. And um, my husband said to me, look, 
you've stopped smoking, the money you save in New Zealand dollars on what you would spend in pounds on cigarettes will pay for you to do your pi private pilot's license if you want to do it. And I was like, that's a great idea. <laughs> how much were so, you spending um, on smoking? I was put, smoking 20 fags a day, probably. Oh, and, um, oh, you know, okay. and so was he. So, you know, we were both smoking heavily and um, great example to the children. And, um, and um, so, you know, that all adds up. Mm. Um, and of course, and so at the time there were three and a half New Zealand dollars to the pound as well. So if you sort of think how much we were spending and then triple it, um, then that, you know, pretty much, um, I guess a sort of a pack of, I don't know, 200 cigarettes would probably pay for a flying lesson, yeah. essentially. So, um, but he said, if you're going to do this, you've got to stop smoking for six weeks before you can fly, because otherwise you won't do it. I thought, yeah, that's also fair. So um, I stopped smoking, which was very, very difficult because I had done it for a lot of years. And I thought I'm going to get even fatter. So I need to move. So I took up triathlons as well, mini triathlons, um, really mini triathlons um, and, and had you know, just built up slowly with that. And after six weeks, I went for my first flight. And I remembered pretty much everything from when I had flown eight years before. And um, it was absolutely brilliant. And I loved it. And um, that's really um, it, literally, as they say, you know, the rest is history. Um, you know, I, I did my private pilot's license. Um, and so we were living at this um, New Zealand Air Force base called Fenua Pai, in, just in Auckland, just north of Auckland. And as part of my husband's job, um, he was flying the P3 Orion um, for their Air Force. And um, he would have to go away quite a lot. So typically, um, when I did my private pilot's flight test, he was actually away um, and we moved house as well. So um, I ended up with three weeks with him away, during which time we moved house. I got my private pilot's license and there was something else that happened as well. I can't remember what I just thought. A convenient trip for him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Isn't it just, yeah. Very hard for him being in Malaysia while I was um, doing all of that. So um, I did very benevolently tell him what our new address was so he knew where to go when he came <laughs> home. <laughs> but it was tempting not to. So um, yeah, and then, then it was a case of our building and that was brilliant because um, you can't be paid to fly when you've got a private license, but you can share the cost of a flight. So people would say to me, can you fly me and my family around Auckland and we'll just split the cost of the flight between us, which was legal and uh, it allowed me to build up ours. So, you yeah, know, bearing in mind Auckland, I don't know if you, either of you have ever been there, but um, there's a, a sky tower there, which is, um, you know, a big tower with an observation deck on it. And it's quite a low lying city. Otherwise there is a CBD with, with a few skyscrapers, but they're not, not too many of them. And you could fly just over the top of all of that and round the, you know, we used to do orbits around the sky tower <laughs> and fly out to the west coast beaches and you know it's just the sort of thing that you look back and think wow um over a city how are we allowed to do that you know yeah I, so, I did my flying training in south africa and it was kind of same deal there the airspace was so open and uncongested it's brilliant isn't it? sort of johannesburg at a thousand feet wow. yeah yeah it's absolutely yeah amazing and all you had to do was just ask, as long as um, Auckland Airport wasn't busy, which it never really was, you know, there would be times of the day when you knew flights would be coming in. But other than that, you could just fly over the top of Auckland Airport to go <laughs> south as well. And you didn't have to go round it. You know, it's just crazy. And, and the things we saw um, were amazing. And, and I built my hours up and I did my commercial pilot's license, which involved another eight exams, um, slightly different system there than here. Um, and then basically I had, then you do a multi-engine rating and a, an instrument rating so you can fly without being in visual contact with the ground. And I got all of those under my belt and then um, applied to Gris Bristol Ground School for their, um, the air transport pilot license exams. And they were in the folders then. Um, we're still sort of talking, you know, 2005, 2000, yeah, 2005. And they came in these massive folders which I had to get from Oxford or from Bristol to um, New Zealand. And um, luckily uh, we had become good friends with a lot of people out there. And there was, they had two um, Boeing 757s, the New Zealand Air Force that they used to fly 
Um, they use them for troop movements, basically, and people movements. And they used to bring them over to the UK for exercises and, and things like that. And they were in the UK at the time when I needed to get my course. So I just phoned up one of the pilots and said, um, if I get this delivered to your hotel, can you bring it back for me? He went, yeah, yeah, no problem. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it would have been amazing, wouldn't it? Except that it arrived at the hotel. They forgot to pass it on. Oh. The 757 came back to New Zealand without my folders. <laughs> oh, Fortunately, no. the hotel took the, took the can for that and they, they sent it out to me. So, um, oh, okay. yeah, so it all worked out in the end. But, um, yeah, it was just uh, one of the, I think it was one of those times that probably was one of the first times I realised that you can just, you can just ask people to do things for you because the worst thing they can say is no. And that's really stood me in good stead for the last year of Wingman, you know. Oh, I can imagine. So, it's amazing the power of having a good network, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I really, I really think the last 11 years of flying have, um, they've, they've done many things, but one of the things that has happened as a result of that is this massive network of people I've been able to call on in, a, in order to put Wingman together in the first place. So, yeah, it's always, um, it's always important to be nice to people, but I think even more so if you if you want to be able to call in favours in the future, you know. So let's um, let's box off this this pilot journey uh, before we, we move on to Wingman. Then you you put all of that into practice, and you were a commercial pilot until you weren't a commercial pilot. What was your what was your journey out of um, out of being a pilot? Let's just say. Well. Um... I worked for EasyJet for 11 years um, and moved around lots of different bases as part of that. And the reason for moving around is because as a family, we moved because my husband's in the Air Force and we were posted. So um, I ended up at Gatwick, um, mainly because um, we, were, we had moved to Lincolnshire, which is not near anywhere in terms of any base I could work out of. And so I was commuting um, to Luton at the time and I said to my husband, look, you know, if I'm commuting anyway um, and your job can move, can we just go home? So we managed to get his job posted back up to Lossiemouth and um, came home to the house that we built and have kept and love. And, um, and this is where we wanted our lives to be and still want our lives to be. So in order to sustain that, I moved to Gatwick. Um, because there's the most flights a day between Inverness and Gatwick in order to be able to get to work. Um, or actually Inverness and London because BA flew to Heathrow and we had mm. Luton and Gatwick. But I, I had seven choices a day of how I could get home or get down. Um, and I'd go down for a block and then I'd stay down there. And in that time I could do Inverness night stops and come home. So it was a really nice setup. But of course, then um, COVID came along and grounded aircraft and we're now down to three flights a week to London from Inverness. Wow. And there were a number of reasons why I made this decision, but actually the biggest was really the fact that I could no longer get to work. So I took the decision to take voluntary redundancy, which was being offered by the company. Um, I also felt that um, it gave me back some control over a life that I felt was a bit out of control because none of us know what's happening. You know, even still, obviously my friends that are still employed, they don't know what's going on all the time. And yes, they're getting paid at the end of every month, but not, I think the pay, the trade off for that was too great for me. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, um, I spent quite a lot of time agonizing about it and obviously talking to my husband about it because of the impact it has on our family. But I took that decision to step back from flying and I don't know if I will fly again it's quite possible I won't um and I'm okay with that if that's the case I'd like to think that I will but you know I'm I'm 47 I've got eight and a half thousand hours behind under my belt um I've been a captain um I've I've achieved a lot of the things that um you would want to set out to achieve at the beginning of a flying career and um you know maybe I'm not meant to do that anymore. Maybe the purpose of me doing that was in order to be able to do wingman and then lead on to other things from there. So I'm very comfortable with the fact I made that decision. And I'm also very comfortable with the fact that if I don't fly again, I've had 11 amazing years working for an airline, really amazing years. I had three years before that as a flying instructor. And then I had all the training before that as well. So I've, I've really 
had some great experiences and I'm a prolific photographer. So I've got some pictorial evidence of that as well, as well as, of course, you know, the ITV documentary Inside the Cockpit, um, which most people don't have footage of them doing their job. So I'm, I'm really, really lucky um, to be in this position. Ben, how would you feel uh, if you were never to fly again? Um, I don't think I'd feel quite so comfortable as Emma's saying there. Um, I haven't reached some milestones which I quite like in my aviation career, such as captaincy. Yeah. Um, because for the non-pilot listeners, <laughs> aviation is a bit of a weird industry, so vast majority of airlines will work on a seniority basis. So it doesn't matter if you're the most experienced pilot ever. If you join a new airline, you start as the absolute lowest member of the pilot community. Um, and I've moved airlines twice now, so three companies in total. So I've had to reset my career a couple of times. Um, so I'd still like to get captaincy at some point. And I, I've, I've not quite given up that sort of flying bug. I really enjoy all the other elements that are outside of flying. But actually flying an aircraft is a very, um, it's a very fun job. Yeah, I, I completely see where you're coming from with that. And I agree that, you know, I'm mostly in this position because I have achieved the things I wanted to. And, um, you know, I was in a very different position six years ago. I, I had a, an illness that almost killed me. And um, I was very fortunate to have that diagnosed very quickly, treated very quickly and literally uh, believe that my life was saved by a doctor at Frimley Park um, and so I was very lucky but I had six months where I had lost my medical and I wasn't a captain and I absolutely felt like you do um, which was that if I don't go back to flying I would have felt a bit robbed of all the opportunities that I that lay ahead of me and that I had worked so hard to achieve so I completely yeah. understand how you feel there. So a lot of people are very driven to become a captain as that is the number one goal. That's not really my goal, but it's definitely, um, you know, it's kind of where you want to be in your career. And if you don't quite get there, I feel like well, it's wasted. You've got to have some career progression. You've got to have something to work towards. So it's, you know, of course it's something people want to do and, and quite rightly should, but you're, you're right that it shouldn't be, you know, more important than the reason you're doing it in the first place, I suppose. No, exactly. So Emma, how was, with the EasyJet inside the cockpit, how was that with um, with the recording and like, did you operate in a slightly different manner to what you would do usually because you knew the cameras were always rolling? Because because obviously, I, I don't want to incriminate you here, but <laughs> um, <laughs> pilots are very very professional, but there is a little bit of informalness at appropriate times in the cockpit when you know yeah. you've got a bit of downtime and stuff. And I don't know how comfortable I'd feel with constant recording of you know, the, my workplace? Well, my camera crew were very good um, and I, I got on very well. You know, I had a, a, for about three months, I had a dedicated film crew pretty much following me around, um, not on every flight, but on a lot of flights. And they came to my house up here as well. And um, so I built quite a good relationship with them. And there was always somebody from the airline with me as well um, to just um, manage things if there was a situation where we perhaps wouldn't want filming to happen which did happen once with the passenger that collapsed into my arms I felt it wasn't right for them to keep filming that after the point at which she was clearly very ill mm -hmm. and I asked them to switch the cameras off and they did and I think that's the right thing to do because that was a massive intrusion of someone's privacy um, and I don't think it would have been right to have continued that but actually um, you know the first day I flew with cameras in the flight deck um, it was a little bit kind of surreal because you're not used to it. But then at the same time, anybody who's known me since I've been young will probably say I'm a big show off. So actually, <laughs> I, I kind of got used to it very quickly and I was really okay with it. I feel very comfortable um, on camera and I feel very, I felt very bold and very comfortable. And at the end of the day, I thought, you know, this is my aircraft, I'm the captain. The day goes how I say it's gonna go. Um, uh, with my team obviously as well I'm not that sort of captain that's like you must do this but mm. um, you know at the end of the day they were guests on my aircraft and they were there um, because I was allowing it so I kind of thought well I'm just going to get on with my job um, yeah. because what I really wanted to do 
was show people what we do at work and what work is like for us. And we were, I was able to do that. Um, Eva, yes, there were the funny moments like Amsterdam and, you know, there's a moment where I couldn't get my torch to work and people commented about how my hair wasn't brushed and I didn't wear makeup and stuff. And I thought, oh, give over. <laughs> really? That's the important thing. And, um, but, you know, there was also a huge pride in being able to sort of show my family even, this is what happens when we shut the door and we're the ones that are taking the responsibility for the 180 people that are sitting behind us getting into the air and down again safely. And um, so it was great. And, and you know, with the, so the, the cameras in the flight deck were fixed. And well, were they sort of GoPros? Like there was um, a, a GoPro behind us that was, um, it was bolted to the jump seat, basically. So in a flight deck, for those of you who aren't aviation people, um, <laughs> in a flight deck, you'll have, it's certainly the, the A320 that I fly um, has a jump seat, which is a smaller seat than the pilot seat that is um, behind the pilot seats and in the middle. So it sort of has a fold down seat and a fold up headrest. And um, it's where um, a trainer would sit if they were doing a, a line check on you, or it's where, um, sometimes you have maybe cabin crew who are on their first day and they get to come and sit in the, in the flight deck to experience what it's like on a takeoff or a landing or whatever. So there's space for someone else to sit and the camera was bolted to that. Um, and of course, this all had to be approved by all the tech people in the airline as well. Um, mm. But they had done it once before, so they knew the format. And then there was a fisheye camera um, and two face cameras that were on the um, combing at the front. Um, and that one face camera for each of us and then the fish eye for the whole um, flight deck. So, and then we had microphones um, as well that were um, just strapped to our seat belts um, and they were on all the time, um, just recording everything. Um, so, you know, obviously a lot of the footage was really boring because it was just us sitting in the cruise or whatever. But, you know, after a while, the cameras are there and you just think, I can't do anything other than my job um, there's no point trying to make things happen. Why would you do that? My, my aim there was to show the professional side of our job. And I had said to them, you know, I don't want anything to appear that would embarrass me, my family, the Air Force, the, the airline, anything like that. And um, it was just literally a case of rolling with the punches and seeing what happened each day. So it, mm. it just became, I just ignored them after a while. But did it, did it change the dynamic in the flight deck at all? Because I'm just thinking, right, when you're in the simulator or when you're on uh, a line check or you've got an instructor or something, you do your job, but there's always, you, you act slightly differently, right? You're a little bit more tense and you, you don't want to make a mistake and you want to make sure everything's perfect. And I guess when you're being recorded to something that's going nationwide, Absolutely, you, you even get, more don't want that to Yeah, happen. exactly. You, yeah. Don't, you don't want the public knowing that you're making a mistake, let alone an instructor. Yeah, well, I mean, it did happen, didn't it, on camera? So, you know, with Amsterdam, um, we were given an instruction to take a certain taxiway. Now, Amsterdam is an enormous airport with multiple taxiways. And um, what actually happened there was that we went a different way round a roundabout than the, the guy in the tower wanted us to go, but we still ended up in the right place and we still ended up um, pointing in the right direction, unlike the, the how they made out, you know, in the documentary. Um, and I just thought, it's happened. We've made a mistake. It was my mistake more than anything. The first officer was all over it as usual. And um, it was my mistake and I just accepted it. And I thought, you know what? Um, the passengers know that something's happening. So I just said over the PA, um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you will notice that we've, um, we appear to be going around in circles and I can confirm that we are and um, that actually this is at the request of air traffic control. Um, it's because we're waiting, waiting for our parking stand to become available. And um, I can assure you it's nothing to do with the fact that there's two female drivers up here. And of course that sort of lighted the room in the cabin and, and we waited for our stand to become free and it became free and we taxied onto stand and everyone got off and it was all amusing. And it was just a piece that they were able to lift out of it. And in context, you'd look at that and go, yeah, actually Amsterdam, is one of those places that anybody could be forgiven for um, you know, going round and round about the wrong way. And when I'm talking about a roundabout, I'm talking literally about a patch of grass that we went round sort of anti-clockwise instead of clockwise. <laughs> and, yeah, Dave, um, if, I, if I showed you the sort of layout of Schiphol Airport, you would just be like, what, it looks like a city. 
Like oh, absolutely. Well, to give you an idea, the runway you take off from if you're on northerly runways is um, five miles from the terminal. And, um, you know, you, you go on a five mile journey, it's actually in a different county. Wow. So it's an enormous place. Um, so, you know, it did happen. And I think the reason that I think they kind of liked filming me is because I didn't try and cover anything up. Mm. The difference, um, the only difference really to my working day was that I didn't swear. I thought <laughs> I'm not going to be caught swearing. And, and I, I hold my hand up, I shouldn't, but I swear quite a lot. And, um, you know, I didn't, I thought I'm not going to be caught swearing on camera because my dad would go mad. He would never forgive me. <laughs> so um, he'll forgive me a lot, but I think he would have been really embarrassed. And I thought, I'm just not going to do that. So, um, yeah, but there were, um, I tried to keep it as natural as possible because the first officers were often a bit more nervous about it because I knew I was doing it and I'd been prepped for it. But the first officers would find out a few days before that they were going to be on a flight that was going to be filmed and were they okay with that? And they'd be like, oh, what, you know, what, what's going to happen here? Is it all all right? And I'd be like, yeah, don't worry about was, it. EasyJet <laughs> was very good at um, employing sort of low hour pilots, weren't they? And taking them through the training system. So I'm assuming yeah. that a lot of the people you flew with were pretty inexperienced. Yeah, um, it's always a mix at Gatwick, probably more so than at other bases. Um, but all absolutely brilliant people. And um, in fact, one of the guys that was in the documentary, in the first episode of the documentary with me, um, went to BA in the end as well. And we're still in contact and he's an absolutely lovely guy. And we just had such a laugh and such a good day out. Um, and then one of the other um, first officers, she was sort of being filmed for the documentary as well. So um, yeah, um, but you know, what you've got to remember is somebody might have low hours, but if they're on the line with you, it means they've passed all the checks and tests and things that they have to pass to be qualified to fly that aircraft. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they haven't got the experience that you've got, but they still bring an awful lot to the party and they're still completely qualified to operate that aircraft. So yeah, and those people tend to be the sharpest as well because they've very much so they know they were up to date yeah. with the books and the manuals and well they've just finished their training so it's like when you become a captain you're the sharpest you'll ever be because you've yeah. just gone through this a very intensive training course. And you try and keep your knowledge up as much as possible, but inevitably, you know, it gets there's a bit more reading to be done each year to to make sure that happens. Do you think hours are the best metric for measuring a, a pilot's suitability? No, not at all. I think that you can have um, you can have pilots that have got thousands of hours of flying, but it doesn't necessarily make them um, it doesn't necessarily make them even suitable to be a pilot, let alone a captain. Um, and I think there's an awful lot of things thrown into the mix, which is why now when you go through a command process, for example, um, you have a, a psychiatric test before you do it and you have to have you know, flights with trainers and interviews with your boss. And there's a huge process to go through, certainly in, in my airline, um, in order to be able to do that, I imagine it's very similar in BA, and I imagine it's very similar in all the other airlines. That there's a there's, there's a it's a three year process from start to finish, really. So the course itself doesn't take that long, but you have to have at the right number of hours, and you have to have the right you have to do technical assessments and all the rest of it as well, um, and you have to have simulator checks before you even get to the point where you can start um, the sort of command course, and and even in terms of being a first officer. So when you start flying you start sitting in the right hand seat of the aircraft and that's um, your role then is as a first officer. And you will be sitting next to a captain who is in the left hand seat of the aircraft and they are the experienced one who um, has more time, more hours and been through more training. You're both equally as qualified to fly the aircraft. Your license is the same, but um, there's different experience levels. Um, to sit in the right hand seat of an aircraft Traditionally, you always used to go through the sort of instructor, multi-engine training, small airline, big airline kind of route. And then about, um, I guess, 20 years ago, that kind of all changed when um, flight training companies came along and said, well, actually, you know, we can do this quicker. And so you end up with a situation where you can have a 21 year old sitting in the right hand seat of a jet um, with a captain um, next to them and they are qualified to fly it, but they don't have the life experience, perhaps. Um, it doesn't mean they're no good. It just means they have less life, life experience, but they might have other skills. But actually some of the, you know, then you could fly with somebody who's maybe had a 
15 year career as a trader in the city, who is also a low hours pilot sitting in the right hand seat and brings a whole different sort of view to the flight deck and a whole different conversation to the flight deck and a whole different array of skills. And um, everybody has been through an interview process and everybody's valuable. Everybody, all, all ranges of people are valuable. And I think that's the only thing that um, about cadet pilots who are very young, I think that there shouldn't be an age limit on that because just because you're in your mid thirties, like I was when I started at EasyJet, um, it doesn't mean you're too old to be able to learn that skill and learn to fly, to operate that aircraft, so. I find, especially for uh, long haul flying, which I've done, that extra life experience is absolutely invaluable because the actual flying you're doing on a 15 hour flight, you kind of obviously manually taking off, you engage your autopilot, you've got quite a lot of work to do at the beginning at the end, um, but there's a lot of sort of downtime in the middle where yeah. you're just monitoring. And if you're sitting next to somebody with absolutely nothing other than aviation under their belt, it gets very boring very quickly. Long old flight, isn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And even actually, you know, although we're short haul, you know, it's six hours to Tel Aviv from London. Mm. Um, that can be a long old day with the wrong person. Oh, but yeah. equally, you know, I've flown with people actually as a first officer. I flew with a captain to Tel Aviv because we kind of thought it was going to be the last time we get to fly together. And I, we were still talking on the bus on the way down to the car park because we hadn't finished all the things we wanted to talk about. <laughs> oh, I love that. So um, I hope he enjoyed it as well and didn't go home with his ears bleeding, thinking, <laughs> oh, never flying with Henderson again, you know. <laughs> but um, I find it really interesting you talking about airports from a pilot's perspective and how ship holes a bit of a nightmare. Because from a punter's perspective, ship holes great because you don't have to take your liquids out of your bag. You can just stick them straight through. <laughs> yeah. um, but the other one is, have either of you flown into the new Istanbul airport? No, I haven't. But because uh, when we landed there, that was one of the last flights I took before everything locked down. Um, it felt like we were taxiing for about 40 minutes after we've landed. It was miles away. Absolutely. Like, That's the case in quite a few airports, actually. So you go to Madrid, it will be the same. And Barcelona is the classic. You know, Barcelona, particularly when you're leaving, um, and particularly if you're a low cost airline, you park. Um, so you can cross the runway to go to the, so they have a landing runway and a takeoff runway. And you can sometimes get permission to cross the landing runway in order to get to the takeoff runway. But it's such a busy airport that they don't often allow it. So you have to taxi all the way down to the end of the runway, then across it and then all the way back down again and then across to go to the takeoff runway. So, you know, and I have done flights as well, you know, from Amsterdam, which have been kind of 28 minute flights. Um, but or, or 35 minute flights or something like that um and then you spend more time on the ground taxiing to get airborne <laughs> and then think, particularly if you have a queue to park as well you can yeah. yeah i think my longest taxi time ever was like one hour and 34 minutes no way <laughs> yeah that, that was in new york i think yeah because in America, they've got a, a bit of a weird system that the different air traffic controllers don't speak to each other. So in most of the world, it's quite integrated. So you'll speak to sort of delivery and then you'll speak to ground and then you'll speak to tower and then you'll speak to departures and they'll kind of pass you on to each other. Whereas in America, those people don't tend to speak to each other. Wow. So, I did not know that. Yeah, so you'll speak to ramp who control the apron where you're parked. They'll say, yep, yeah, you're cleared to push back, no problem. You then taxi off the ramp and they'll switch you to ground, but they won't tell ground that they've released you. So you speak to ground. This is completely new information to them. Ground are like, oh, well, we've got 40 wow. aircraft in front of you. Join the queue. Oh, no. Like, okay. How does that even ever work? That's, bi that's, that's bizarre. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> It makes you realise, I think, how lucky, you know, how lucky we are with air traffic standards in Europe um, mm -hmm. and, and actually particularly in the UK, you know, um, you kind of, the French air traffic controllers are very good, very professional, as are the Dutch. And, you know, around Europe, there are a number of different air traffic control units that you think, yeah, they know what they're doing. I trust them. And there are some that you kind of think, I just want to check that. Um, and when you get back over into UK airspace and you hear, London control you just think oh, I'm home <laughs> it and, is a uh, very 
Yeah, it's a very sort of comforting feeling, isn't it? That first London controller. Yeah, very much so. And actually, since um, you know, in the last sort of nine months or so on LinkedIn, I've, I've made a connection with one of the c controllers at Swanwick. And um, we've kind of chatted a bit and it's just brilliant to put a face to a name because what I find quite frustrating is that you talk to these people several times a day and you don't mm -hmm. know what any of them look like. So I've met some of them at, you know, um, air days and things like that or families days and things. And um, you just think, oh, it's actually really great to know what you look like. And they think the same, you know, they're kind of Start recognizing voices, don't you? When you, oh, when you absolutely. Come in, especially at like certain weird times of the day when it's very quiet. Yeah. You're from the North Atlantic, log into London, and you're like, oh, I know you. I obviously don't know you at all, but I recognize your voice. Well, the other thing is, as a female pilot, they get to know your voice. And then particularly, um, I was doing the Inverness route a lot so that I could get home. And, you know, you get handed over to London or Scottish, and they, you, you'd almost sort of hear them almost saying, oh, hi, how are you? Because <laughs> 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 they knew that it was going to be you flying back to Inverness for the night, you know. <laughs> Um, right, let's talk about Project Wingman then, because I just thought we were going to have a quick chat and then really sort of dive in. And we've been on this call for about an hour and it's been so... I'm sorry. So, no, no, <laughs> please don't apologise. It's been such a lovely chat and we've, we've found out so much. Um, right, Project Wingman then, what, what came first? Your idea to take redundancy or Project Wingman? Which was, what, what order did they come in? So Project Wingman came first. Okay. Um, so back in, you know, February, March time, when there was this kind of weird virus happening in China and it wasn't going to affect us, was it? No, um, never. And suddenly we're, we're sort of sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, last week it was all OK. And now we're looking at sort of Armageddon. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and I very, very vividly remember, um, you, you, know, you have moments in your flying career that you're always going to remember, like your first solo and things like that. Mm. I very vividly remember what has turned out to be the last flight I ever captained. Um, because I can remember being on board it and knowing that we were looking towards being grounded. And everybody had this sense of anticipation on board the aircraft. So everyone knew something was about to happen, something big was about to happen. And, um, you know, we landed at Gatwick, everybody got off the fly, everybody was in tears, the passengers as well. We were all thinking what's gonna happen next. And, um, during that flight and probably leading up to it as well, I had already been thinking to myself, you know, if we get grounded, there's thousands of air crew that are going to be stuck at home doing nothing. And at the same time, there's, we're being told there's a massive pressure on the NHS. So surely there must be a way of marrying those two together. And I, um, airlines have um, peer support systems in place and I was one of the airline peers. So I, through that, I had met um, a guy called Professor Rob Bohr, who um, is, he is the clinical psychologist at um, the Royal Free Hospital in London, but he's also a world leading aviation psychologist. And he um, and his colleagues at the Centre for Aviation Psychology, they oversee the peer support programmes at a number of airlines, including EasyJet, BA, Norwegian, um, and, and many others. Mm. So I knew him from my peer support training and the program that he oversees and I was chatting to him and we were sort of throwing around some ideas and saying that there must be a way of helping and he said let me put you in touch with this guy who was a captain at BA and so the three of us kind of chatted and then I, the, the, from those conversations there came this idea that actually we could send air crew into hospitals to support um, NHS staff during their working day and it there were so many ideas of how that could work and it was you know we could um have 24 hour cover seven days a week in you know wherever and and it that evolved to um well actually that's not really what they need and and we spoke to the hospitals and and this other um colleague um had a partner who worked for a hospital in london at the whittington and they just grabbed it with open arms and said yes we need that mm -hmm. So um, it, it just grew from there. And then and the wingman name really just came from, and Rob and I were sort of just messing around on a phone call one day and we're saying, well, what could we call it, you know? And uh, I said, well, it's obvious, isn't it? We call it wingman, Project Wingman, because it's like, we're Top Gun. And um, <laughs> he said, 
do you think we could get away with that? I said, yeah, of course we can get away with that. You can't own an idea. So, um, <laughs> so he said, well, I, in that case, I want to be, um, I want to be Maverick. So I said, all right, then I'll be Goose. So, <laughs> you know, we really messing around with it and um, having a bit of a laugh with it. And, and it became a reality, you know, and um, Project Wing Ran just grew from this, um, pretty much an idea scribbled down on a piece of paper. So um, Dave, the guy from VA said, well, you know, I can speak to the hospital. So I said, okay, I can probably get people to help. Um, so, uh, you know, I just put the message out on internal comms at EasyJet on Workplace and, and, and on my own Facebook and social media and said that if you're air crew and you're grounded and you want to help us do this, please email this Gmail address that we set up. And, uh, and you know, we thought, yeah, we'll probably, you know, I'll, I'll probably help him to support a couple of hospitals in London. That'd be great. You know, then I can sit back and do my garden or whatever. And um, within a week, there were 700 emails. And I was thinking, that's a bit much for me. I don't think I can keep doing this all the time, you know, transferring this to a database all the time. So I asked a friend to help and she came in to sort of take that over. And then I asked another friend for help and we just grew and grew and grew and grew. So our first lounge opened um, in the end of March. And um, within a week, we had another five, I think, in London. And w by the time we got to the summer, we had five and a half thousand volunteers and we'd had 84 lounges across the country. So, and we're still opening them. You know, we opened in Belfast just before Christmas. So, um, you know, a lot have closed now, but there are still a lot opening as well. And who is getting in touch to volunteer? Is it predominantly pilots and cabin crew or are you hearing from other people in the industry too? So it's all car pilots and cabin crew working in the lounges because they are DBS checked and have yeah. airside passes and that provide and also have the um, the customer service customer facing skills yeah. to be able to um, yeah to be able to manage a lounge situation. Um, so there are a number of things we needed to put in place in order to just protect people, and that was one of them. We said you need to be air crew. But actually, there have also been a number of people who said, look, I'm not air crew, but I can do this. You know, I can, I'm a crewing officer, so can I help with some admin? And, and I've worked in press. Can I offer my services in, in media? Um, which has been amazing. And, and they've come from all the different airlines in the UK, including airlines that aren't even based here. We've got volunteers from KLM and um, Norwegian obviously has a base here, but and we've got United Airways and American Airlines and Emirates and um, Qantas, all sorts of airlines, including all the UK airlines in the mix as well, which is fantastic because what everyone's discovered is it doesn't matter what colour uniform you wear. Mm -hmm. We are all the same people because we all do the same job. So we, we get each other. So it's been a full industry effort. Uh, speaking of, uh, the doesn't matter what colour uniform you wear, you do get people to turn up in their uniforms, don't you? Yes, absolutely. So the point okay. of um, that, I mean, we had to get permission from the airlines for that. And I've been very lucky over the years to have a good working relationship with management at my airline, maybe mainly because I worked at Luton and that's where our base is or our sort of admin headquarters are so you kind of see people there but also because I just talk to people all the time so I don't worry about what their job is I just talk to people because they're interesting so I, I texted our director of flight ops and said um, I'm just doing this thing and can we please get permission from you to allow people to wear uniforms and by the way can you text all your flight ops mates and ask them for their airlines as well and he went, yeah, no problem, absolutely. His, he has a sister who works for the NHS, so he was all over it and really supportive. And he, there's a WhatsApp group for directors of flight ops. Who knew? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so he just, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So he just put a message on there and said, can you all agree to this as well? And they did, So, um, okay. which was amazing. Um, so, yeah, so the uniform is there to differentiate, so to identify you as you know, being air crew so that, mm people know what you're there to do and and also it helps obviously in lockdowns if you're traveling to a hospital in a uniform um airline workers are key workers but also our lounge volunteers are key workers so they're allowed to go and do things and it just gives people a sense um you know i just think it would be slightly different if you just you know you wouldn't want to turn up in jeans and a t-shirt mm. and say i'm here to look after you it just gives a different feel to it yeah. so um 
which which really really helps but obviously inevitably over the year there have been redundancies or people that feel their airlines haven't behaved in a way that makes them proud so they either can't or don't want to wear their air, uh, airline uniforms anymore so we've provided a, a wingman uniform which is very literally i say uniform i mean it's a, a scarf or a tie and a lanyard and a pin mm. which you then wear with a smart shirt and smart trousers or skirt so yeah, you know, because we wanted people to still feel that they were part of the wingman family, even if they'd lost their airline. So yeah, because I look at the I look at the tagline uh, on the website it says airline crew coming together to support the well being of frontline NHS staff during the COVID nineteen outbreak. But have you found it's worked the other way as well? And your wingman volunteers have also got some of that support that that they may have needed, whether they realized they needed it or didn't realize they needed it but getting involved has helped them too yeah absolutely and I mean I still get messages all the time from people saying thank you so much for creating wingman you've saved my life or you've given me wow. something to focus I mean the saving my life message I was like wow um you know we've made a profound difference to the lives of our air crew volunteers that we had no idea was going to happen and actually wouldn't know about if they didn't actually bother to tell us as well. You know, the fact that they want to tell us what a massive difference it's made to them. Um, because it's given people a sense of purpose. Um, it's given people a reason to get out of bed in the morning, put their uniforms on um, or our uniform. Um, but I think when you go to work, and I, it doesn't really matter what industry you work in, when you work with a group of people that all do the same thing, you have this kind of sense of camaraderie amongst yourselves you know pilots just like to talk about pilot stuff I imagine sports journalists like to talk about sports journalism stuff as well you know I think that you just <laughs> you get each other you all know people in the industry that you can you know have you heard about this have you seen this um, so when you remove that from people by saying well you can't go to work and you can't even leave your house that's really really difficult mm -hmm. for a lot of people and of course everybody went into this um, from a different point of view as well so it's not like everybody went into this going yep yeah, I'm completely okay with my life mm -hmm. we all had maybe elderly parents or relationship problems or, or children struggling with things or money problems or whatever it was they were don't, we all had that stuff that we carried into Covid and Covid has only made that worse so actually being able to go out and spend a day in a lounge with somebody where you're it gives you two things it gives you the the camaraderie and friendship and support, but it also gives you a really massive sense of well-being to know that you're helping other people. And, mm. and the NHS staff that we've been benefiting, it just makes it, there's something about doing that for nothing mm. that makes you just feel good about the world, you know? I think everyone's realized in the last year or so, the importance of having that sense of purpose. Yeah. And I think a lot of people that uh, are furloughed or maybe redundant, just feel completely lost because I mean especially in aviation sort of being a pilot that is it's not it's not really a job it's kind of who you are it kind of defines you a little bit very much so absolutely and I felt that very keenly you know even mm. before I took redundancy I was like well who am I and I've already been there you know six years ago when I lost my medical I turned up we moved house to um, we moved to Bushy Heath and I turned up there with my children at boarding school and not working. And I thought, well, who am I? I'm a mother whose children aren't here. I'm an airline pilot who's not flying. You know, and I'm, a, I'm a, an able-bodied person who can't walk mm. because of my illness. And, you know, so I'd already been through that once and, and been through this journey of redis uh, rediscovery, I suppose. And then to have that again this year, although I hadn't taken redundancy yet, I got to sort of April, May time and thought this is, get, this is worse than we all thought it was going to be. And I was working hard on wingman, but at the same time, I was having this massive identity crisis because I was thinking, but I'm Captain Emma <laughs> and now I don't know who I am, mm. you know, um, which has been quite a challenge to um, overcome. But we've all had to overcome it because we've all actually had to dig deep and go, OK, if I'm not going to be Captain Emma anymore, what else can I do that's going to keep me busy um, give me a sense of purpose, give me something to do. So obviously Wingman has been there, but we've all found other things we can do, like you setting up Pilot Base, you mm -hmm. know. Absolutely. We've all found other things that we're able to do. And I really think that's going to be something in the future for, I think pilots really take their jobs for granted. And I think we think it's our medicals that's going to stop us from working normally. 
And actually it's not, it turns out we all should have something else up our sleeves. And the number of people I know who've um, just turned their attention to other things is just astounding. And they're, and they're astonishingly good at it as well, which is wonderful to see. Did you enter the Wingman Bake Off? No, oh, I didn't. Oh, what? <laughs> I was a judge, so I couldn't. <laughs> So yeah, I was one of the judges. Judge is the best though. job. Yeah, you chose. You <laughs> yeah. chose well. What was the standard like? It was amazing. It was absolutely brilliant. And um, I just thought there was some such fantastic designs that came out of that. You know, there was, um, I think one cake was like done as a runway with a plane landing on it. And I was like, how do you turn cake into that? You know, <laughs> it's brilliant. But the only sad thing for me is that I didn't get to eat any of it oh. because you know, it was all done on looks because... You know, the cakes were all around the country. I kind of hoped somebody might say, well, if you send me your address, I can box it up and send it to you. <laughs> but nobody did. So, <laughs> and we've had some brilliant challenges like that. So we did Bake Off and we've done, um, you know, we did the Three Peaks Challenge we set for ourselves in September, which was huge fun. And that is where the, the only time I've ever sort of seen some of our volunteers actually um, was going down for that. Um, and we've did, we did um, a Wingman Workout Weekend um, so we've been doing some little things along the way that have just to keep people. So, so it's done for fundraising, but actually it's also done with the awareness that if you get encourage people to get to get outside and do stuff, that is also good for people's well-being because we've all got to get outside in the fresh air more. And um, yeah, so but bake off, bake off makes you feel good as well. You know, who doesn't love cake? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, be completely honest with me then. Is the only reason that you've decided to invest in wingman wheels so you can go around and do regional bake offs next year and try all Pretty the much. cakes? Is yeah, that the... <laughs> yeah, you've got me there. Absolutely. That is the only reason we need that bus. And it's, uh, it has to be a bus to fit as much cake as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh, well, well, tell us about tell us about Wingman Wheels then, because that seems to be the big fundraising project at the moment. So as um, as things evolved, like so, last summer as things started to ease off, um, a number of lounges closed at the end of July because there was a, a perception that we were through the storm uh, and out so. the other. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> But, you know, I don't know if you can remember back that far because we've had 28 lockdowns since then, but <laughs> um, things seemed to be easing off and the hospital said, well, actually, we'd like to reclaim our space mm -hmm. and um, therefore we need to um, we need to just close the lounge and, and we'll look at this, we'll look at revisiting it again in the future. And we thought, well, yeah, but there's still a need for well-being, and there's still some places we haven't been able to go to and also going forward we've got to make wingman sustainable well we had two choices we've either got to say okay we're going to wind it all up or we continue but we make it su sustainable going forward so it what's not sustainable is 84 lounges being manned seven days a week um by air crew if they're especially if they're going back to work but even if they're not going back to work people need to earn money so they go mm -hmm. to other paid employment or they just, we're finding, you know, we've got a bit of COVID fatigue. People are, have been giving so much for so long and they just want a bit of a break, which is completely understandable and fair enough. But we thought, actually, if we could have lounges that move around, um, we can reach places we haven't been able to go to yet, but we can also make it sustainable because we're asking you to give us two weeks a year or mm. two weeks every two years or whatever, rather than this kind of indefinite, sort of expectation that you're just going to be there forever and um so we had already got this kind of lounge in a van concept which it wasn't actually the lounge it was the delivery of things to hospitals so that we could create lounges but it kind of sparked this idea that we could have mobile lounges and sometime during last summer the idea of a, a bus came up and um we just grabbed it with open arms and actually one person in particular a guy called Rich Griffin um he just loved the idea and and having sort of been a little bit hesitant about how much he wanted his involvement in wingman to be because he's got other things on the boil he just went for it and he said yeah I love this idea and he has pardon the terrible pun driven the bus project <laughs> <laughs> um right from then I mean literally within a couple of days 
two of them had gone on and found out, you know, can you buy a bus? And they went, right, we found buses we can buy. And I was like, you love this so much, don't you? <laughs> and um, so, but then they said, well, actually, if you can buy a bus, let's find a place that you can really buy a bus mm. that actually meets our needs. And we found um, a place down in Kent that had the perfect bus available. Um, it's already been converted by um, a well-known supermarket brand and that rhymes with middle. And... Um, <laughs> They'd been using it as a mobile um, kitchen to go and do like cooking tours. Who knew? Right. And um, so it's it's had it's got a glass roof that's been raised so that even tall people can stand up in it. And it's got fully fitted and plumbed in kitchen. I thought you looked tall, even though you're sitting down. Yeah, I'm six, <laughs> six or five, so I don't fit in. Well, that you'll you'll well. fit in our bus, so you have to come yeah, visit it. Yeah. But it's this lovely. It's got wooden floors, a TV screen at the front, and a fully fitted kitchen at the back. Comfy seating in it that's in our colours already. And then when they took the um, wrap off the the sign at the front, it had a heartbeat on it, and we just thought that is Perfect. something that you know we couldn't have predicted. It was meant for us, yeah. So we, we basically put down a deposit on it and said, yeah, well, we'll raise the money for that, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we committed to um, a crowd funder to raise £100,000 and we raised, it closed yesterday at 25, which we're really actually amazed about because um, although it didn't reach the 100000 we had been looking for, we've actually reached some of that by um, getting funding from trusts as well. So the rest of the funding will come from corporate conversations mm. we're having. But to even have raised 25 grand in the last five weeks is astoundingly good because of the situation we've, we're in, you know, a lot of people don't have spare money to give. And if they do, they're probably going to spend it on making themselves feel better, yeah. which is fair enough. So, um, yeah, I'm really, we're just amazed by that. But we've also got, we've been left with a number of donations of things that we're now going to need to decide what to do with. So we, we, we're going to, there's going to be something coming with that in the future. And that's things like, I mean, we've got um, a Eurofighter sim with Colin McGregor that um, has been donated to us because I happen to know him. And um, which, and also because obviously I've got a connection at Lossy Mouth. Um, we've got all the runway lights from Lossy Mouth's runway that was dug up that are in a field opposite my house at the moment that we're going to get rid of. And um, we've got Red Arrows memorabilia. We've got golfing weekends. We've got hangar visits from Logan Air. We've got so much stuff that's been given to us and simulator visits as well. Wow. So some of that stuff has been um, bid on, uh, has been bought at the crowdfunder, but some of it we've still got. So there's going to be something else coming up in the next few months where we maybe have an auction or something like that to um you know keep that sort of thing going and, and the next thing is that one bus is great but more buses mm -hmm. is better mm -hmm. and so my dream would be to have six so that we've got one for scotland one for the north one for the southeast one for london one for the midlands and one for the southwest um, or something like that yeah. so that we can get around people more um and just provide a bit more support. And, and we're, we're looking to use the bus as a mobile vaccination centre as well, which is where oh, we're getting some funding from the NHS for. So there's all kinds of things coming out of this that are just really exciting and just um, you know, gonna carry us into this year really um, in a slightly different format. And we'll probably end up with five or 10 static lounges as our legacies, but the buses will be where our focus will be mainly this year. Is there any way people can is there any way people can continue giving you money now? How, how can people donate and help Project Win then? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the crowdfunder page is still available and there. Um, that's um, www.crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash wingman wheels. So um, it's still there and you can still donate to it. Um, we also have a Just Giving page as well. Um, or people can just contact us directly and we can give them the bank account details and they can make a transfer. So it depends on how people want to do it, really. Okay, um, we'll, we'll put all those in the show notes as well. So yeah, people yeah want I'll send you the Just Giving link. Yeah, so, so some people might say, well, I haven't got any money to give you, but if you've got a skill that you can use that you think might benefit us, that is just as valuable as 10, 20, 100, whatever pounds. You know, you might be, you might be a, a bus fitter you might, you know, you might, that might be your thing. You might be a, somebody who sprays buses mm -hmm. um, or sprays cars or whatever, and you can offer some time for that. You know, there's loads of ways people can help us. And actually in helping us, 
that's then helping the NHS and that's helping to keep us all a, sort of afloat, but actually hopefully helping to get the country moving again, because what we really want is to get the country moving again so we can all go back to work. And I don't like the idea, I don't like the phrase going back to normal mm. because I don't think there is a back to normal when we've been through what we've been through. I prefer the going forward to a new normal kind of analogy. Um, but that's where we want to be, isn't it? Because we want to go on holiday and we want to have business trips and we want to see our friends and our families and our loved ones and things. So that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? I know how much you pilots love paperwork, so I can't wait to see how many come forward and put in for their coach license so they can <laughs> drive the thing. Well, you would probably not be surprised to know that we already have a number of people who are already qualified um, coach drivers <laughs> or ATV drivers. And in fact, um, I've got one friend in particular at Luton who has been driving um, HGVs for the last month or so, or two months, I think, to supplement his income. And he said, I'm quite, I'm quite quiet in January. Use me as much as you want. Amazing. I'll drive your bus for you, which is fantastic. It so really is. They're all queuing up. They're like, can I drive the bus, please? Do I get back? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's a brilliant story about Paul Gascoigne driving a London bus. Please don't get yourself in any situations like that. Oh, <laughs> you no, just well, throw a celebrity the keys. <laughs> no, that's never going to happen. And the other thing that's not going to happen is, you know, what, what we're very wary of is um, because the bus has a raised roof, mm -hmm. it means that it's even less likely to go under low bridges. Oh, so we've got oh, to make yeah. sure any routes that we take are routes where the bus can fit. So there's no point saying, yes, we can come to there if it's surrounded by obstacles that a, a bus with a, a raised roof is not going to fit through. So. <laughs> so you've built something quite incredible and just listening to you for, for this amount of time or just visiting the website or hearing people's testimonials. We've got a friend of the show who was one of your volunteers and, and he talks in his episode about how much it meant to him which is actually the reason I asked you whether or not you, oh. you'd noticed it had gone the other way as well from mm. uh, the people involved from aviation. Um, you've already talked about legacy but what does Project Wingman look like in a post-Covid world? Well I think that um, Project Wingman has a shelf life that lasts well beyond Covid mm. because well-being is something that we all need and um, yeah certainly people in the NHS are always going to need well-being support and you know the, the people we've spoken to and getting the lounges established have said you know what this has done is pushed well-being up the agenda which is something they've been trying to do for 10 12 years whatever so firstly I hope that it's going to um, leave behind a legacy of um, well-being support in NHS hospitals and in NHS trusts and there are places you know like in Surrey for example where we set up a wingman lounge that closed um, after a period of time as a wingman lounge, but the lounge still runs as a wellbeing hub operated by the hospital, which is exactly what they needed and exactly where they should be. So the fact that it's not run by wingman doesn't matter because it's the fact it's there that's important. Um, so raising the agenda, raising it on the agenda for NHS hospitals, absolutely brilliant. But you know, as we go into the post COVID era, whenever that may be, we're all going to need some well-being support. So it might be that hospitals are sorted and um, have processes in place because don't forget they already have well-being support in place. It's just that it was overstretched because efforts were being diverted elsewhere. But you know our local towns and our local cities and villages are going to have people in them that need some support as well. So it might well be in the future that if we've got buses we might say well you know, we'll contact the mayor of the town and say, look, we're coming to visit your hospital, but if you want to put the word out that anybody that needs a bit of wellbeing support um, in the future can come and, and get that. And it might well be as well that it's not then limited to air crew doing the support. We might find that we've got other volunteers who are able to come along and say, well, actually, I'd be happy to you know, make cups of tea and talk to people. Um, I'd love to see that become a reality um, and actually you know, as part of my sort of post airline career world, um, I've recently joined the trust of um, a local, our local hospital, which is going to be redeveloped into a health and wellbeing centre for the town. Um, I actually went for a paid job interview, but didn't get the job, but ended up as a trustee. So. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but I'm very excited about it. And I think that wellbeing is 
something we've all known that we've needed for a long time, but we're all much more comfortable about using that word now and saying, well, actually, you know, and, and asking for help as well and saying, you know, this it's okay not to be okay campaign and things like that. We're all much more aware of the things that we need going into the future now. And I really would, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Project Wingman will be here for years to come, either in a static lounge um, where we, yeah, as I say, with our legacy lounges, which, um, you know, there are probably a maximum of 10 of those is probably what we could support um, or with our buses. And, you know, the, the bus plan is a five year plan. So, you know, I'm sort of hoping that in five years time we'll be well out of this and all meeting up in pubs and looking back and saying, oh, do you remember that Christmas when we couldn't <laughs> see anyone, you know? Oh God, I hope so. <laughs> yes. There's Tell me on your face there, Dave. Oh God. Yeah. Oh, you said you said five years. Oh. I hope it'll be a lot sooner than that. Oh, me too. Emma Henderson MBE, Captain Emma Henderson MBE. I hope you get that on a business card one day. Um, thank I will, you. don't worry. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing not just where the Project Wingman journey goes, but where your journey goes too, because I think it's going to be a very exciting one for you and everyone oh, you're involved thank with. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. And um, it's been a real pleasure. It's been great speaking to you both and uh, I've really enjoyed it. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for listening to the Pilot Base podcast. We'll be back next week with another great guest from the aviation industry. Don't forget to check out our new career platform at pilotbase.com and all the socials at Pilot Base HQ. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and write us a review.